I'm going to welcome everybody to the virtual presentation for HSC Physics and Engineering Q&A session. And our host for today is Ben Nicholson. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Carolyn. Good morning, Stage 6, and welcome to our virtual panel Q&A session held today, learning of the principles of electromagnetism. In this session, we'll take a close look at how electricity is generated through the power of water and break down how charged particles, conductors, and electric and magnetic fields work. We'll touch on the motor effect and the generator effect and how we utilize these concepts every day at Snowy Hydro. We'll be answering questions on the key concepts that come up, come up often in your course. And toward the end, we'll find out more about our panelists and learn about their STEM careers and the pathway they followed to Snowy Hydro. This session will be recorded and uploaded to Snowy's Next Generation online learning portal on our website for you to access and watch again. Let's get into it, shall we? First, I'd like to pay respect for where we are. We would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Narrago people on which we meet today, and the various lands where you all are, and pay our respects to the elders past and present. We are all on different lands today, and we acknowledge those who come before us. Welcome to all the schools who are joining us today, and I hope you get a lot of value out of this today, and we move on and um, find a lot of value out of it in the future too. To formally introduce myself, my name is Ben Nicholson. I'm a mechanical engineer with Snowy Hydro, and I'm your host today for the virtual experience. In my role day to day as strategic engineer, I get to oversee the major work that goes into keeping our hydro generators available for service, even though most of them were installed long before I was born. So it's a really great opportunity to do that. Today, our panel will tackle questions covering the science of Snowy Scheme to explain how we generate renewable energy and some of the physics behind the story. I'd like to introduce our panel of engineers that will be providing insight as they share their expertise around the physics and engineering of the hydro of hydropower generation. Each of our panelists will provide a short intro and what it entails. And first, I'd like to introduce Sarah Roder. Sarah. Thanks, Ben. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Sarah Roder, and I'm a mechanical engineer here at Snowy Hydro. Uh, I've been at the company for around four years, um, and my current role is I'm working on the Hunter Power Project, which is a new uh, power station that Snowy is uh, building in the Hunter Valley, and it's a gas-fired power station. Thanks, Sarah. And how about you, Rebecca? Yeah, hey, thanks, Ben. Um, hey, everyone. My name's Beck. I'm a graduate mechanical engineer. Uh, I've been at Snowy for two years now on the graduate program. Uh, I'm currently working at in the Murray region, and behind me you can see Murray 2 Power Station, uh, which is where I get to hang out sometimes. Yeah, so it's been a really great so far. Wow, it's a pretty cool power station. And Ryan. Thank you, Ben. G'day, everyone. My name is uh, Ryan Shord. I'm, uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, I've been at Snowy for probably the better part of eight years. Uh, I'm currently working as the manager of plant engineers in Murray. Um, so I work with Beck. Um, I should work with Ben and, and Sarah also, but um, day to day working with Beck. Um, and I'm joining you today from the control room at Murray uh, Switching Station. Very cool. A really interesting location, that one, Ryan. Um, I think you were the only one with a real background, so that's really good value for everyone here. Uh, well, let's get into it then. We'll get into it with an overview of Snowy Hydro and how we aim to underpin Australia's transition to renewable energy future. What does this really mean in the context of renewable power generation? To kick, it, to kick us off, we'll throw it back. So, Beck, a question for you. What is Snowy Hydro and what role does Snowy Hydro play in the renewable energy sector? Well, to start off, I'll just define what renewable energy is. So, uh, renewable energy is electricity generated from renewable resources, which means that the resource is naturally replenished and doesn't run out. So, such as wind, solar and water. So, at Snowy Hydro, we generate electricity um, using a couple of different sources. So, the main one that you've probably heard of or seen is our hydro power stations, which use the renewable resource of water. Uh, and these are located throughout the Snowy Mountains. 
Um, and in addition to um, water, we also have are involved in the renewable energy sector through some power purchase agreements with solar and wind farms. So this allows us to buy renewable energy um, without actually having to own the asset. Now, in addition to water, Snow Hydro also has um, other forms of energy, which is through our gas and diesel plants, like Sarah mentioned before. So these are located throughout New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. Um, and this brings our total number of power stations to 15. So and in addition to that, we're also constructing the new gas and diesel site in the Hunter Valley and a new pumped hydro station, Snowy 2.0. It is certainly a lot of power stations around the place. Um, it takes a lot of effort every day to get them going. So that's cool. Thanks, Beck. We had a good story there about Snowy Hydro and its energy generation. So let's move now into a bit more detail and get a better picture of how the science works. Before we try to understand electromagnetism, we need to get our heads around the mechanics of how, our, how a turbine works. For this, we will throw to a mechanical engineer, Sarah. Could you describe the mechanism, please? The question for you formally is, how does a turbine work? Right, thank you. Uh, so this diagram that's up on the screen here is a, a great way of explaining it. Um, and to understand how a turbine works, we first have to um, understand and recognise the first law of thermodynamics, which is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Um, and any form of power generation uh, obviously has to apply by this rule. Um, and for us here at Snowy Hydro, uh, it's the conversion of gravitational potential energy into finally electrical energy that we harness. So our water is held up high in our reservoirs up in the Snowy Mountains, um, and there can be up to several hundred metres between our intake structures and our power stations, which sit down at a lower level. Um, and because of this uh, height difference, there is a gravitational potential energy between uh, our power station and where that water is sitting. So we have large uh, gates, as you can see on the left there, the head gate, um, which allow water to flow in through our penstocks, um, which, is a, which is converting our gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy as that water flows down the, the hill through our penstocks. The water then enters the turbine, uh, which creates rotational energy and spins it around. Um, and it's coupled to a rotor, which will then create the electrical energy. Ben, if you just skip to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so you can see here a bit more of a detailed cross-section of our units. Um, and the bottom half of uh, the picture there is what's called the turbine, and that's the mechanical components. Um, and then the top half is our generator. So our water comes in from the left there through the main inlet valve and enters what's called the spiral casing. And it's called a spiral casing because if you look at it top down, it looks a bit like a snail uh, in that it reduces in diameter as it gets uh, closer to meeting itself again. Um, and this water spins around and enters through our turbines. Uh, and most of our turbines here at Snowy Hydro are what's called Francis runners. Um, that's the specific design and shape of them. Uh, and it means our water enters horizontally and leaves vertically through our draft tube. Um, and our uh, rotational um, our, our turbine there is coupled via the shaft to our generator. Um, and I'll pass over to Beck now, who can talk about uh, the top half of that picture, which is our generator, which is our electrical component. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So yeah, as you mentioned, the top part is the generator and, and is sitting above the turbine. Um, now, there are two main parts to the generator. There's the bit in the middle, which is the rotor, and that's the rotating part. And this sits inside of the stator, which is the stationary part. Now, both of them have many conductive, uh, many loops of conductive metal cores, and this can create magnetic fields and allows the electricity to move. Um, now, Ben, if you can just jump to the next slide for me, there's some more pictures here of our actual units at Murray 1 and T3. So, um, so what you can see again is the, yeah, the, the rotor in the middle, which is the spinning part, and the stator on the outside. So the spinning rotor creates a magnetic field and this generates the electricity in the stator core. So if we think about it, generators are just energy converters. They're taking the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft and converting it into electrical energy. And now the 
other side of this is, or the opposite of this is motors, which uh, convert electrical energy into mechanical energy. So yeah, they're actually quite simple when you break it down. Very cool, thanks Beck and Sarah. Next, we're gonna go even further into the detail and we're gonna talk about charged particles, conductors and magnetic fields. Ryan, question, first question for you of a series, what is electrical current flow? Thanks Ben and thanks Beck and Sarah. Um, so electrical current, um, I like to try and take things back to their, their absolute basics and, and, and finding what they are. And so to answer some of the later questions, this is a, this is a useful question to answer. So um, to answer this question, a lot to start with uh, understanding what a, what a conductor is also. Um, so a conductor um, in, by sort of definition is something, a piece of material that will allow um, charged particles to move easily uh, along its length. Um, and what we're most used to seeing is, is that being metals. Um, so copper, for example, um, and those charged particles are usually electrons um, and metals by, by the way that they're structured um, allow those electrons um, to, to move freely along their length. Um, so that's what a conductor is and, and, and that leads into sort of what, how you can define current and, and the definition of current is, is how much charge passes a point um, per unit time. So it's essentially the number of electrons that pass a point in a conductor. Does that make sense? So, and one amp is one coulomb of charge per second. Um, um, so if you're thinking about electrical current, um, you can draw an analogy to water in a pipe. It's essentially electrons in a wire um, flowing. The more electrons flowing, the quicker they're flowing, the more current you've got. Thanks, Ryan. It sounds a lot like um, fluid flow in a pipe to me, but uh, I'm a simple mechanical engineer, so we'll move on with the electrical side of stuff. Um, next question that's in here is, um, what is a magnetic field? Um, so this is also a pretty useful concept to try and wrap your head around, and it's one that um, I still struggle with, um, actually what a magnetic field is. Uh, and the best way that I can reconcile in my head what it is um, can be represented sort of by these, by these pictures. So essentially, um, the way I describe it is like a, a vector field, which is a complicated term, but essentially it means um, it's lines that define how uh, a, a magnet or an electric charge would behave in space influenced by, um, by a magnetic field. Uh, and the best way to describe that further is, is, is visually uh, with the two pictures on the left. Um, so uh, most people would probably have seen the, the science experiment you do where you take a permanent magnet, um, you sit it on a piece of paper and you tip some iron filings down on the piece of paper and you get something like what looks like in that left-hand picture there. And that's that's visually showing you what I, was, what I was describing there before. You can see that each of the iron filings aligns itself with um, the, the magnetic field um, and gives you a visual representation of it. That middle picture there is is a similar concept, but it's using essentially the pointers out of a compass. Um, so a compass um, is is what we use to to navigate it. It tells us where north is. Um, it does that by aligning itself with the Earth's magnetic field. Well, that means a compass is also influenced by any magnetic field. So if you put it near a magnet, it'll point towards the the north pole essentially of of that uh, of that magnet. Uh, and that little picture in the middle there just shows you a whole bunch of little compass needles around a magnet to try and show you what that field sort of looks like. So, and, and the direction of those needles and the direction of those ion filings tell you a story about how a, how a charge would be influenced by that magnetic field if it was in that space, essentially. Um, and um, yes, that's the best way that I've wrapped my head around it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, then we've also got on the right there is, is worth noting that um, you don't just need a, a bar magnet or a permanent magnet to get a magnetic field. Uh, you can also make one out of a coil of wire and put by passing current through it. Um, so that's quite a useful thing. Um, so from the magnetic field perspective, the field isn't really any different, whether it's permanent magnet or a coil. 
Um, but I just thought that I'd mention that uh, that is also a way you can get a magnetic field. Thanks. Wow, thanks, Ryan. I think for me, for a personal thing, magnetism has always has been and remains for me the nearest thing to magic that we've got. Agreed. But it does work and we make it work every day here. So um, it's really useful that it works. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. Right, hey, on to the next question. How do charged particles and magnetic fields interact and how is this useful? Um, this will be a fairly long sort of uh, answer to your question, but it's a ripping question because uh, it's uh, one of my favourite topics uh, and actually plays uh, quite well to what I believe the audience is learning at school. It's definitely what I learned when I did physics at high school. So, um, and, and hopefully I can help see how it's useful in reality because that's something that I missed when I was at, at high school. It all was interesting and but didn't make much sense about how it was actually used. Um, so the way I'll start here is with um, something that's called the Lorenz force. Um, now that is a fundamental law of physics and pretty much what it says is it says that if you take a charged particle and it, if it's moving at a velocity through a magnetic field, that electron or the, sorry that charged particle which i deal with electrons uh will experience a force and that's dictated by that uh little equation that we've got there uh on the left hand side there so the force the charged particle will see is proportional to um the magnitude of its charge the magnitude of its velocity and the magnitude of the magnetic field um so a way that's visually represented, um, there's quite a good photo there down there on the bottom left. What that's showing you is a electron beam being shot straight out into a magnetic field. And because it's their electrons moving through a magnetic field, they've got another force put on them, the Lorenz force, and that causes them to do a big curl around. Um, and it's a, it's a flash bit of kit they've got there that's got a heap of fluorescent stuff in there that makes it glow when the electrons hit the gas inside there and that's how that's how you can see it so um but uh, if there was no if you turn that magnetic field off that that purple line would just flatten out and just go out straight so that's that's a demonstration of this lorenz force um one point i'll make about that is that um the the magnetic field direction the direction of the electrons velocity and the direction of the force that's on the electron or the charged particle are all at 90 degrees to each other. So you can actually use uh, the, the left-hand rule to try and understand what, what will happen um, and, and the direction of force uh, on the charged particle as it's moving through the field. Um, um, all right, so that gets us to the... Um, how this links to the motor effect now on the right hand side of that picture there i've got um on the, the right hand picture there we've got a, a couple of uh, magnets a north and south pole and there's a magnetic field between them there's a length of wire in there and we connect a battery to that length of wire which allows a current to pass through it so we've got a current flowing through a wire that's in a magnetic field now the current as we described earlier is just charged particles moving down the wire, which are just electrons. So we've now we see ourselves, when we put that current carrying wire in the magnetic field, we've got moving electrons in a magnetic field. And by the Lorenz force that we just described, um, that's gonna create a force on each of the charged particles in that wire. Now, there's lots of charged particles in there, um, lots of electrons in a piece of wire, uh, all of those little forces add up to create an overall force on the wire. And so when you put current through the wire in the magnetic field, the wire wants to move. Um, that's described by the equation there on the right, which is essentially um, you can directly take from that Lorenz uh, force equation uh, on the left. Uh, and it says that the length of the wire uh, multiplied by the current through it, multiplied by the magnetic field will um equal the force that is on the um on that wire uh, that's essentially the motor effect um, all a motor 
and, and a generator really is, is just a, a box full of coils and magnets um, arranged in such a way uh, in the case of a motor that when you put um, current through that coil um, and it interacts with the magnetic field, it wants to move. And that's how you get the rotating um, motion out of the motor. So, um, so yeah, so if you can go to the next slide, please, Ben. So that then leads us into Faraday's law. Um, now, I'm just going to start still talking about um, the Lorentz force and how, and just try and make a link between the Lorentz force and Faraday's law. Um, and I'm going to think about it now, not in terms of the motor effect, but the generator effect. Um, so if I take the same example um, that I had before, which is pretty much that photo or that picture down the bottom right, I've got a coil in between um, two magnets. Sorry, Ben, the one on the right. I didn't order those pictures very well, sorry. Um, so I've got a coil of wire between two magnets. So again, we've got wires in a magnetic field. But I'm not going to put a current through it this time. I'm just going to spin the coil by hand. Now, like we said before, um, the wire is full of electrons, full of charged particles. I'm not making them move at this point um, using current but I am making the move in the, in the magnetic field by physically moving the wire. Um, so I'm moving the wire physically, which still means I'm moving charged particles in a magnetic field. Now that's by the Lorentz force is gonna create a force on those, um, on those electrons. But instead of the electron, the force on the electrons um, causing the motor effect, it actually wants to push the electrons down the wire. Um, it acts in a different direction. And all of the electrons wanting to be pushed down the wire is essentially uh, the voltage. A voltage appears across that coil. So you can see using the same um, Lorentz force law and applying it differently, which is purely that I turn the coil instead of put a current through it, um, which is what you do with a generator, I now get a voltage on the outside of my coil. Um, and that's essentially the generator effect. Um, so you can take that Lorentz force law and you can apply it and do some, there, there is a derivation that's quite complicated and way beyond my pay grade uh, to get to Faraday's law of induction. Um, but that's the fundamental concept that lives in my head anyway. So um, there is a derivation that you can get to Faraday's law with it. Um, and by extension of, um, on top of what I just described, that voltage that's generated on, on on that coil is proportional to the number of coils that there are, a number of turns in the coil, and the rate of change of magnetic flux through the middle of that coil. I suppose if you if you picture yourself looking along the, the lines of flux as the as the coil rotates, the effective area that the flux can go through, or the hole in the middle of the coil gets smaller and smaller. Once the coil's in line with the field, as shown in that picture there, um, there'd essentially be no flux through the coil. As you continue to rotate it, you'd get more and more flux until it was um, perpendicular to the field. And then that would that cycle would repeat. Um, so as you rotate it, you get a continually changing um, uh, flux through the coil and that rate of change um, is proportional to the, the voltage that you generate. Um, the bottom left picture there shows Fleming's right hand rule, um, which you can use to predict which way the current will want to flow or, or the polarity of the voltage that you generate based on um, the direction that you rotate the coil and the direction of the magnetic field. Um, again, it's just, just the um, all three vectors, if you like, are uh, uh, 90 degrees from each other and they. Uh, it's just a representation of that Lorentz force law. Um, the top picture I've got there is a simple transformer, uh, and, it, and it works the same way in terms of Faraday's law, um, which says that, again, if you change the flux um, through the middle of the, of the coil, you'll induce a voltage on it. So here we've just got, and I talked about electromagnets earlier. So we've got a coil on the left, which we put a current in. That creates a magnetic flux. We use a core to carry that flux over to a second coil uh, and we induce a voltage in that um, in that second coil. Um, we can 
make the input voltage and the output voltage is different based on the number of turns in the coils. Um, but it, it all it all comes back to this um, to this Faraday's law. Uh, all right, next slide, Ben. Pretty cool, right? This is getting deep. That's good. We love it. Um, well, that thankfully is probably as deep as I'll uh, take it. Um, although I did mention. Uh, do you just mind going back? Sorry, I did forget one thing that I was going to was going to mention. I got in the red there that there's uh, Lenz's law. Uh, that's worth mentioning. Uh, that essentially that when you induce a voltage in a coil, the current that flows as a result of that um, as a result of that voltage will generate its own magnetic flux, and that magnetic flux will oppose the one that created it. Um, so it's yeah I'll, I'll leave that there so Without effectively they don't keep building more. on themselves yeah yeah that's right so nothing for free all right so now i'll just try and, and draw some parallels to like uh to real life so i've shown some pretty basic examples of um electrical machines uh and but in real, like in reality, they're actually not that. They're more complicated because of the scale of them, but the fundamental concepts still hold true. So, what I've got here, the picture on the left is a picture I've been talking to in the last few slides. The picture in the middle is a generator at Murray One being pulled apart, um, and the picture on the right just shows you which which part of the. So it's just the generator. The turbine's been disconnected at this point. Um, so. On the pitch on the left, uh, like I mentioned, you've got two magnets and a field between them and a coil of wire. Um, and you rotate the coil of wire in the magnetic field. Um, that's a relative motion of the coil to the magnetic field. So it actually doesn't matter whether you hold the magnet still and spin the coil or hold the coil still and spin the magnets. It's the same thing. So we actually do the latter. Um, at the power station. So in the in the center photo, you can see a big red round thing being lifted out of a hole. That big red round thing is just a big lump of steel with a bunch of magnets stuck to it. Um, each of the sticky outy bits is a magnet. Um, it's an electromagnet. Um, so we turn them on and, and we turn each one of those um, poles, they're called, um, into a magnet. They go. Um, we, so we spin that. They Sorry. go north, north, south, north, south yep. around the circle, don't they? Yes, they do. That's exactly yeah, right. Cool. Um, so, and when that's down in the hole, we spin it with the turbine. And down in the hole, you can see where I've got that lower red arrow. Um, there's a, another big lump of steel, which has a whole bunch of coils stuck into the surface of it. The whole way around. There's 180 of them in that machine. Um, and those remain still so we take the magnets put them on a shaft spin the turbine which spins the shaft which makes the magnetic field move relative to the coils of wire that stay still so it's just a really big scale of that picture on the left um, and it uses exactly all of those principles that i talked about in exactly the same way to put a, a voltage out that we then connect to the power system and help run your hot water service and your toaster at home. Um, go next one, Ben, please. Um, and similarly, that's how the, the it works with the generator. Um, this is a transformer and how it works um, and try and draw a parallel to real life. Um, the picture on the left is uh, the one I briefly spoke about uh, earlier regarding Faraday's law and how the transformer works. The center picture is the guts of a transformer at Murray One power station. So that generator in the last one is actually connected to these transformers. Um, and the picture on the right is showing you it all assembled, uh, what it looks like when it's in service. The middle picture is, is obviously it being pulled apart. Um, and it pretty much looks exactly the same as in real life as what it does in the in the basic concept. Um, uh, our, our machines are three phase, not single phase. So you're actually looking at um, both in in the concept drawing and the real drawing. They're single phase transformers, but um, 
Uh, I won't bore you with that detail. It's not really relevant for this discussion, but um, you've essentially got uh, two coils. You've got a, a primary coil and a secondary coil, uh, and you've got a core that links them between them. So again, when you put a current through the primary coil, it creates a magnetic flux. The magnetic flux flows through the core and through the middle of the secondary coil. And by Faraday's law of induction, when you have um, a changing magnetic flux, you will generate a voltage on the uh, secondary coil. So, um, and you can see there that I've got the arrows pointing to the red bits of the core uh, and the big um, coils wound with, they've got paper and oil insulation um, on the left and right of the primary and secondary coils. So, so anyway, so that answers that question very long winded. Ben, thanks. That's awesome. I think to throw some numbers for those who like the numbers, we generated about 15,000 volts off our generator. Is that about right for Murray? Yep, that's at the generator. Yeah, and then we use this transformer to convert that to 330,000 volts to um, send it along those wires that you can see there behind Sarah. Yep. Yep, and all that, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, all of the, all of that stuff I've shown you in those photos is in the power station that sits behind Sarah there, so. Yeah, and then before those useful electrons get to you at the other end, uh, you can expect another one of these transformers that works the opposite way around. So it takes the 330 and converts it back down and down and down and down and down to the 240 volts that you see in your house. Well, hopefully you don't see it. Hopefully you uh, just know it's there by having everything work. Ooh. Oh, yeah, thanks, Ryan. That's um, a really good explanation. Now we're going to move on to um, on to how we use this stuff in real life. So for you, another question for you, Beck. What are some of the other applications of the motor effect? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, so, well, there are actually heaps of applications of the motor effect, and it can be as broad, broad as anything that has a rotating shaft. So I think the most common application for the motor effect is electric motors. So um, in the picture, you can see on the screen, that's a Tesla, so that's an electric vehicle. Um, now, the, so the electric vehicle uses the motor to rotate a shaft, which will turn the wheels in your car and allows you to drive forward. So it converts the electrical energy from the battery into the mechanical rotational energy of the shaft. So that's a simple, simple way to use the motor effect to, to drive a car. Um, other examples are um, you know, electric scooters, uh, fans, washing machines. There's, yeah, there's lots of things in your house that, that use the motor effect. Um, but at Snowy, we have kind of, uh, we have a few different applications and, and one of them is called dynamic braking. So this has to do with the generator and turbine that we've sort of been talking about this whole session. So dynamic braking slows down the unit and by converting the rotational energy into heat, by electrical means. So you use the motor effect to slow down the unit instead of using traditional friction brakes like you find in your car or your push bike, which is where like the disc, um, you know, physically attaches to the rotating object to, to slow it down. Um, so, so that's one use. And another use is uh, for our pumping stations. So we use the electrical energy to pump water up, upwards or up the hill. Um, so this is, uh, we use it in T3, um, also Jindabyne pumping station, and it's also going to be in our new Snowy 2 project that we're currently building. And I think Sarah's going to touch on this a bit more uh, when she chats about it later. Very cool. Thanks, Beck. Well, that sounds like I better throw over to you, Sarah. So how is electromagnetism harnessed to support electricity generation on a large scale like Snowy Hydro? Yeah, so as uh, Ryan explain to us um, our generators obviously use the uh, electromagnetism um, and the motor effect uh, in, in reverse to generate our electricity um, and our role here at Snowy is to convert uh, that water that's available around in our physical location um, into electrical energy that can then be sent out um, through our trans through the transmission lines um, out to your homes so uh, that electricity, which is sent out to your homes, as uh, Ben and Ryan touched on, is obviously stepped down to uh, 240 volts. Um, and your appliances at home then convert that electricity into other useful forms. Uh, so such as when you charge your phone, it's converted into 
your chemical storage of your battery in your phone um, or if you plug in your toaster, it's converted into heat so that you can cook your toast. Uh, so here for our hydro scheme, uh, we have nine hydro stations and we have 33 turbines um, and it, we can and we have a total capacity of 4,100 megawatts. Um, and all of our plant is spread across the Kosciuszko National Park. Um, and as you can see here, this is what's called our scheme intelligence, uh, which is a live dashboard. This is just a, a screenshot of it uh, while it was doing something interesting. Um, but it's our, our live dashboard that we can use to have a look at what our uh, generating units are doing at any given time. Um, and so our power stations are split uh, sort of down the middle um, on either side of the Australian Alps. So we have what is called the Tumut development and the Murray development. Um, and because of the physical location of these, we are able to generate into both the Victorian grid and the New South Wales grid. Uh, so our Murray development, uh, which is on the left there, we can see Murray 1 and Murray 2 power stations. Um, they're physically on the Victorian uh, side of the Alps and therefore generate into the Victorian grid. Um, and our Tumut development on the right there, which has Tumut 1, Tumut 2, Tumut 3, uh, which you might have heard us referred to as T1, T2, T3. Um, and they can generate into the New South Wales uh, grid. Uh, and something interesting about our dashboard here um, is it's something that our local control centre, which is here in Cooma, um, actually use. Uh, so we can, we're able to operate all of our units from one central location here in Cooma. Um, so we're able to turn on and off units, uh, which is a, a job that's also done by our traders. So in response to any market events or market demand, we're able to turn on and off our uh, generating units as required. Um, and it's what allows us to be what's called a peaking plant rather than your, your gas or your, um, your coal stations, which are more of a base load uh, where you turn them on and they, you expect them to run. Uh, for quite a large amount of time, our units are quite quick to turn on and therefore we can respond to market events quite easily. Really cool. Thanks, Sarah. You've spoken a lot there about our generators, which uh, you can see here in red when they're turned on and uh, green when they're waiting to turn on, and grey when they're turned off completely when we want to do work on them. Um, don't we have a lot of pumps as well, some really large pumps? Yeah, so we've got quite a few pumps uh, throughout the scheme as well. Um, so one of uh, we have one power station that's purely dedicated, or one pumping station that's purely dedicated to pumps. That's Jindabyne Pumping Station um, on just left of that. Yep, there, um, and that allows us to pump uh, out of Jindabyne Dam and then across to G High. Um, and as you can see, we have various tunnels um, around the scheme, and in this way, we're able to move our water around. Um, to develop, uh, sorry, to generate power um, on either side of the scheme as required. Um, our water, our tunnels also help us with our storage. Um, but then we do have some power stations that have the ability to be run as what's called pumped hydro. So Tumut 3 there, you can see three of those units have a little extra bit hanging off the bottom of them, um, and they are the pumps. So we're able to uh, run those units to pump water from Junima, which is obviously downstream, back up into Talbingo. Um, and in this way, we're able to then release our water back down through Truma 3 and generate if required. Um, I might get you to jump onto the next slide, Ben. So this is just a, a very simple explanation of um, how pumped hydro works. So obviously in generating mode, we're releasing water through our penstocks, running it through our turbines, um, and as uh, Ryan explained, it then uh, creates our electricity, which we send off to our transformers and across uh, the transmission lines out to your homes. Um, and we tend to do this in times where uh, electricity is required by the grid. So if demand is high for power, uh, we'll obviously generate some, some power. Um, and then our uh, pumping units, which is what uh, Snowy 2.0 will be as well, is, is a dedicated pumping station. Uh, sorry, uh, reversible pumping station. So we're able to run our units physically in reverse. So spin the turbines backwards um, and we'll suck up that water and send it back up the hill um, so that we, in, in essence, recharge that reservoir 
um, and it's what can be likened to a battery of we fill our water back up into that reservoir and therefore create more gravitational potential energy that we can run back down through our turbines um, and we're essentially recharging like a battery. Um, and we do this at times where there's excess energy in the grid. So it might be a day where there's lots of wind blowing, so there's lots of renewables and lots of solar um, and there's excess energy that's being generated so we can draw off the grid to run our pumps as motors to send out, uh, run our units as motors to send our water back up the hill. Um, and that's the basics of what a pumped hydro station is. And that's what Snowy 2.0 is aiming to do. Wow, thanks, Sarah. Sarah. Um, well, I think that brings us to the end of a technical section. Um, in, that, in those sections, we've looked at all of these ideas of electromagnetism and how we utilize those concepts every day here at Snowy Hydro. Um, look, we really are, it's, it's a little bit political, but we are here to keep the lights on. So that really means being able to provide that extra little bit of electricity that the grid needs. Um, whenever, the, whenever the demand changes quite quickly, we can react to that and provide that little bit in. And then when there's a bit of excess, we can also use that to recharge the batteries and be very useful to a lot of people all at once. I'd like to change pace a little bit now and move on to a bit more about the people here that we that we employ here at Snowy Hydro and really get into what it was that led us to our career here. Um, so I'll open up with Beck. So Beck, what led what led you to a career in engineering? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, so my dad's also a mechanical engineer. So I sort of grew up around that and, and seeing what he did. Uh, and he worked on tunnels. And I remember when I was younger driving around Sydney uh, and getting to drive through all these kind of cool tunnels that he built and to be able to like visually see, um, you know, what he'd worked on. I found that really interesting. And, and that's kind of what led me to engineering so that, you know, I could get involved in interesting projects and you can uh, visually see the outcome. And also like they positively impact people, um, you know, with tunnels that really helped people's commute um, and getting around the city. So, so that's why I kind of got started into engineering. Um, so then I went to study at the University of Sydney um, and towards the end of my graduation, I was like, trying to work out where I wanted to go next. Um, and I was really interested in the renewable energy sector. Um, you know, I kind of wanted to work in a field where, um, you know, we're sort of contributing to, you know, a better future and a better environment and things like that. So that's where I found Snowy. Um, and I really wanted to move away from the city in Sydney and sort of move to a more regional area, have a better lifestyle and, and get to work for a company that yeah, gets to work in such a beautiful location and, and work on really interesting assets. So that's, yeah, that's kind of how I got started here. Really cool. Thanks, Beck. What about you, Ryan? Well, um, so the thing that got me into engineering to start with was... Um, I uh, love fixing things. Uh, I loved figuring out how things work, pulling them apart, putting them back together again, not always successfully. Um, so, yeah, when I was a kid, I'd, um, you know, toys would break, I'd try and fix them. Um, I would had old cars, I'd try and pull apart and sort out, wire up things on them, um, you know, pull gearboxes apart just to see, try and figure out how they worked. Um, don't know how I end up electrical in some some days, but um, uh, I think I just liked the um, the the bit the big electrical stuff um, blew my mind. You know, three phase power, these sorts of things. Um, uh, the things I learned at physics um, really got me interested in it. So um, when I was at school, um, so I knew based on that. Um, that engineering was probably a pretty good uh, career path for me. So ultimately, I um, I ended up going getting a going to university and and getting a job at, um, at the Port Kembla Steelworks, uh, and I did uh, my electrical trade there and um, my electrical engineering degree at the Steelworks. And um, yeah, no, a bit like Beck, I was um, I was I was keen to move to a, a smaller place. Um, because I'd originally come from one, and 
Uh, and then, yeah, I got the job snowing um, and I've been here, been here ever since. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, that's about me. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. I think I might jump in my nose in there because I also am a product of the steelworks in Port Kembla. Did a similar thing, but down the mechanical path. But before that, for me, growing up was all about Lego, really. That's the one constant in my life throughout all my younger school career. Also, just noticing things like loving maths and having lots of electrical kits, the DIY wiring kits that we used to play with as a young tacker was really cool. Um, I really liked being doing stuff with my hands, so that was a fairly good leading indicator, I presume. But mostly, I think one thing I would like to point out is just listening to the people around me and taking on their suggestions for what I might like to do. These people like parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents and friends and all those sorts of things, they are quite well experienced at the world. Even teachers too every now and then have a pretty good idea of what you might like to be in the, what, what, what your loves can turn into in the um, wider world when you get out of school. Um, so they were a big influence. And then for me, moving on to um, the steelworks after high school was really cool. Got a trade, got a, got a degree, and um, then it's a pretty common story, it sounds like, looking for a little quieter life, but um, discovering that it is a pretty noisy life here in Cooma. I'm pretty busy trying to keep these things going. So here I am today trying to do some major overhauls of these units and um, having a lot of fun doing it. Now that I've rudely interrupted, let's uh, move on to Sarah. Sarah, well, how about you? What led you to your career in engineering? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think that was uh, yeah interesting hearing about your career as well um, and everybody else's. Um, so I've got a, a similar story, I guess. Um, I always, through high school, um, loved maths and physics and really found it very interesting. Um, and I'd always be asking my parents how things work, much to their annoyance, I'm sure. Um, but anything I could see, I would ask, how does that work? Why does that work? And try to ask everything about it. Um, I also have an older brother. Uh, so growing up, um, I'd always have to play Lego with him and Meccano. So we'd always be doing whatever he wants to do, um, which turns out I, I enjoyed too, um, and even playing with scale electrics and train sets and that sort of stuff. Um, so, but when I finished year 12, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, as Ben was saying, there's quite a few people around me who had different ideas. Um, and my older brother had gone and done mechanical engineering, um, as well. And I actually, um, I, I had a passion for the environment, um, renewables, um, and sort of how the future was going to play out. So I actually started, uh, studying a law degree. Uh, with a major in environmental science and, and policy. Um, and after one week of that, I decided that that was crap and I didn't want to do that at all. Um, it wasn't satisfying my uh, my curiosity. The bit that I was really interested in was that environmental side of it. Um, there just wasn't enough of it for me. Uh, so I actually switched to mechanical, en uh, mechanical engineering um, with a major in sustainable energy um, production. So that's what I was always interested in and studying through university. Um, the renewable energy um, generation was really what interested me. Um, and that's why uh, when I finished my final year, um, I came to Snowy as a graduate and did three years as a graduate here at Snowy Hydro. And then now obviously working uh, on the Hunter Power project. Yeah, cool. That's um. It's really interesting for me to learn all the different ways that we each have to get here, but there's heaps and heaps of similarities too. So thank you for that, you three. Um, a question for all of us again then, what is a re something a bit more aspirational and future driven? So what does a renewable energy future mean for you? Um, we'll go with me first. For me, it's just simple. It's all about cleaner air. Um, as an ex-asthmatic, yeah, I'd, I really love being able to breathe and I'd really like to continue to do so. And to get there, I'm all about storage. That's what I'd love to see this company do really, really well, is just become really good at storing electricity and being, or storing the energy and being able to get that electricity out the door when it matters most to the country. What about you, Sarah? 
Yeah, so um, as I said before, I've always been really interested in um, renewable energy um, and always knew that that's sort of the way of the future um, as we move away from our finite resources. Um, but then obviously I'm currently working on the, uh, the Hunter Power Project, which is building a gas-fired um, power station. So I, I've got to explain myself a little bit there. Um, but I, I really, along this journey, have um, really come to the understanding of why we do still need um, some form of thermal energy um, or, or non-renewable energy um, as the transition piece to our renewable a fully renewable grid. Uh, so our gas-fired um, power station that we're building at the moment is what's called firming up renewables. So when the sun doesn't shine or when the wind doesn't blow, you still need something that can turn on um, and, and supply your electricity as you need it. Um, so there's uh, yeah quite, quite an interesting way that the world is moving um, as we transition towards renewables. Um, and even the new new technologies such as including hydrogen in in your gas um, fuel mix um, is an interesting way that we can sort of ease that transition. Very cool. Thanks, Sarah. And Beck. Yeah, well, I think with what Sarah said, at, like at the moment, we still need those non-renewable sources. But for me, you know, I think the big goal would be to be able to generate all of our electricity through renewable sources um, and I think that will that will take time and it will take a lot of development of new technologies but I think that's sort of a future that we can all sort of strive for yeah Ruby and finally you Ryan in front of that really cool switchboard what's the future for you mate um it's uh the transition to renewables is a is a very technical problem and a big one to solve um in the power system at any instant in time, the power out of it has to equal the power into it. Um, with renewables, you don't get to choose when the power goes in. It just happens by nature. Um, and that often, in fact, most of the time, doesn't line up with when we need that power. Um, and so the real key to that technical problem is storage uh, and figuring out how to store that, that energy um, and, and um, to make it available when you need it. So once that problem is solved, then the uh, becomes fairly easy then. <laughs> I hope it's as easy as you intend. Well, that's really good. Well, thank you very much, you three. Uh, I'm going to move on to the closeout now. So today, just a bit of a quick review first. We've covered turbines and how they work, generators and how they fit with the turbine. We looked at charged particles and charged particle flow, leading us to the idea of electricity. We've covered electricity and magnetism and how they're intertwined and how really two parts of the same thing, which is a single concept known as electromagnetism. We've looked at the motor effect and the generator effect. And we've looked also finally at how all of this comes together at Snowy Hydro to convert potential energy in elevated water into useful electricity for the electricity market. Our engineers here at Snowy Hydro are focused on maintaining and modernising the assets we are privileged to work with. We enjoy a long history of reliable operation that is thanks to the thousands of people who've worked with us for nearly 80 years so far. Engineering is but one of the many career paths you can follow at Snowy Hydro. Others include accountancy, trades like fitting electricians, weather scientists, snow and water experts, data analysts, business analysts, and a whole range of computer experts, electricity traders, human resources. And I'll tell you what, we've even got a few baristas who work here too. And it's really cool to follow all sorts of different career paths. Um, we hope you've enjoyed this Q&A session, taking a deep dive into the science and a bit about the uh, business of Snowy Hydro. And I'd like to thank our panel of experts, Beck, Sarah and Ryan. And I'd like to, uh, and also to everyone here who's on the line today, thank you to all the students who joined us today. It's really cool for us to be able to show off what we've got here and um, get everyone excited about how we can move this thing into the future. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, everyone.